there's three key components to, to any business. Um, somebody to make it, somebody to sell it, somebody to maintain it. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. Please allow me to introduce today's guest on the show, Preeti Sri Ratana, an esteemed architect hailing from the New York-based studio Modellus Novus. So as managing director and one of the esteemed founders, Preeti steers the course of the endeavors of the practice, focusing on strategic direction and fostering their growth. His dedication extends beyond the realm of architecture as he is deeply involved in community shaping and ensuring accessibility in all of the studio's projects, embodying their ethos and creating spaces for the many. Notably, Preeti serves as the board chair for Apex for Youth, an organization recognized with an official commendation from the city of New York. He is also a co-founder and esteemed board member of Sweeten, a national renovation marketplace, and contributes his expertise as a member of the entrepreneurial board of Venture for America alongside his advisory role at the Asian American Policy Review at the prestigious Harvard Kennedy School. His commitment to education and community upliftment shines through his co-founding of Central Queens Academy Charter School, a beacon of educational excellence in Queens, and his architectural journey commenced in Paris under the mentorship of the renowned Jean Nouvel, after which he pursued his academic endeavors culminating in degrees from esteemed institutions such as the University of Illinois and Columbia and Harvard University. He proudly represents the first generation Asian American immigrant narrative hailing from central Illinois and Preeti attributes his success to the nurturing environment of the public school system. So this was a really interesting conversation uh, with with Preeti in in their studio. And um, one of the things that came up that Preeti mentioned was how they had gone about marketing themselves uh, as a practice. And I'll often be very cynical of architects when they say, oh, we just focused on good work. That was the the marketing strategy. And we've often said here at Business of Architecture that that is the base level of marketing that uh, any practice should be doing. Um, and Preeti was an architect who indeed did say that. And I think it's worth just listening, though, to the strategies that they did employ and noting the kind of high visibility projects that they were doing in the first place. So um, Modellus Novus do a lot of high-end uh, hospitality work and some of their projects and, and very uh, kind of innovative designs that were creating very unique brand and restaurant experiences of these places that caused a real stir and uh, were no doubt leveraging as well the kind of PR marketing campaigns of the restaurants themselves. Um, And and this is interesting because this is where the design in itself is marketing. Okay, because of the nature of these projects. So we talk about that and and how they grown the business and how they went from uh, a, a relatively small studio to a large practice over a quick amount of time. We discussed inclusivity and designing a practice that part of their values is to have a diverse perspective on how they're designing for the city. And in order to have a diverse perspective, then they need to have an inclusive environment of employees. And we also talk about why architecture struggles to be diverse. And we look at the finances and the importance of good business practices when running a design-focused architectural studio. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Preeti Sri Ratana. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. 
interested in becoming a sponsor, please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Pretty. Yes. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Very good. Excited to be here. Excellent. Well, thank you for your patience with our elaborate setup this afternoon. Um, it's a very cool setup. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm pleased with it. I'm pleased with it. And so we're here in the Woolworth building in an yes. architectural icon in the office that you guys... Did you, did you start the office here or did you have another local? No, we started um, uh, just off the Bowery in a much smaller, um, more humble office. Great, great. And that was about, what, 20, uh, 2014? Um, we, we launched the company in the beginning of 2015. Mm -hmm. And we were in that office space until 2017. Right. Um, the quick background story is we started in 300 square feet. It was like your classic, this is an old former foundry building um, that's just off the Bowery. It's uh, Christie and Stanton Street. And... Um, 300 square feet. We grabbed some Ikea tables that were left in the hallway as we were moving in. Uh, we splurged on three uh, used Aeron chairs and we had the classic egg crate. Gotta got to have the Aeron trend. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and we started our practice there, myself and, and two partners. Within a year, we need to double in size. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we were able to get the space next door, so we combined it, so we got the 600 square feet. Um, within a year of that, we need to double again. Uh, that was already 2017. And because the types of clients we were getting, um, the fact that the only two toilets on our floor always had one clogged, always had another <laughs> that had a broken door, we are like, we cannot bring our um, higher caliber clients here. Yeah. Uh, so we made the leap. Uh, moved to the Woolworth building, we found what we joke, but I don't think it's a joke, it uh, was the smallest available space that might have been um, their storage. Mm -hmm. uh, so we moved into a thousand square feet and then within a year of that, we need to double in size again. So um, fall of 2018, we signed a lease for our current space, uh, 7,000 square feet, and um, took possession fall of 19, did a full gut, six months and then moved in March 2nd, 2020 and right before lockdown. And then you, and then you had to go home. And then we, we did remote. Um, we did come back, uh, and have been here ever since Memorial day of 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, still paying peak of the market, 2018 rents. We have a great landlord who's worked with us overall. Um, but even now we, we've been very fortunate to have expanded into this space and are in talks to expand um, again on this floor. So amazing. Yeah, it's, it's been pretty crazy. So it's a, a quite rapid growth um, for you guys. It was three of you that, prepped, that yeah. started the, the business. Yeah. And I know you were saying earlier as well that you, that you had a background in, um, you, know, you studied at Columbia, is that right? You did your master's? I did, yeah. I did an undergraduate University of Illinois in Champaign um, in architecture and then came to New York to do my MRC at Columbia. Right. Yeah. And then did you go straight into work after that or did you, what yeah. was your foray into the, into the tech world? Um, well, a lot of people don't know this. I was uh, very ambitious and quixotic, let's say, coming out of Columbia. Um, I quote unquote started my own firm because uh, I had an opportunity with, with one or two small projects and, and I was... Uh, very ambitious and I think like a lot of architects believe that through great design it'll somehow solve the business problem because that design is going to get you published and notoriety and somehow you're going to be able to start a practice. I was six months into that practice which I um, was able to recruit a friend of a friend of a friend right. turn to work with me and six months into it I remember I was generating invoices for a new client and I needed the invoices to like look more professional. And I spent an entire day designing the invoice in Microsoft. And I remember at the end of the day, I was like, I hate this. I hate everything about this. <laughs> and I made the decision then that I was going to close shop, but I needed right. to finish those projects. So it ended up taking me another 12 months. So, um, Long way to answer your question. Coming out of Columbia, I spent 18 months trying to do my own thing. 
learned very quickly there are more facets to architecture mm -hmm. than just doing great design. Um, went to uh, cut my teeth and went to SOM. Right. Uh, I should share before that my first internship in official architecture job was at Jean Nouvel's office in Paris. I did that um, uh, the previous summer in grad school. Right. So that was like going to work for my idol. Um, got me very excited about, even more excited about um, the profession and its mm -hmm. potential. Um, graduated, tried to do my own thing, hated it. I uh, decided to go to SOM, had an opportunity to work there. And honestly, I kind of dreaded it. Um, it was not the type of place that I, that I was on my list of places to work, but I did tell myself this is going to be my unofficial MBA into mm -hmm. the business of architecture because I want to understand how the machine worked. So I ended up being there for two-ish years, um, which is a long time. Right, yeah. Uh, and then end, ended up actually being laid off summer of 08. They beat me by two months. I was going to leave that laser tape, but <laughs> but they they got to me first. Um, was did you get redundancy package at least? I don't remember to be honest. Or they were oh okay, it was pretty brutal. So no, I, do, I will say this, and and I I look back on this fondly, and it was even fondly then as it happened because I was I was already getting ready to leave. Um, I believe I, I, I was in the uh, first wave of many waves of layoffs that happened that fall at SOM. And I believe I'm the very first one they called in to let go. <laughs> <laughs> Which I even laughed back then. I was like, this is amazing. Um, but <laughs> I ended up I ended up spending the next couple years um, doing architectural consulting work, basically um, helping uh, other friends start practices or working with firms to I would still have people that would come to me and be like, you're an architect, right? Oh, I have like this small apartment renovation. So I would, I would work with uh, other friends, firms to do it. So it was more of a, not formal architecture per se, but show and sell thing. Um, but long story short, I eventually met uh, a fellow architect who was starting a tech company that was in the, originally in the home renovation space. And um, I don't know how, how deep to get into this because this is going to be a whole separate topic. But the reason why we met is I went back to school. Mm -hmm. um, went to go get a Master of Public Administration um, up at the Harvard Kennedy School. Right. The reason why is ever since I came to New York, I was very active with a nonprofit youth organization called Apex for Youth. Uh, they mentor at-risk Asian immigrant youth. Longer story. I can relate very much to these kids and I stand on many shoulders that allowed me to have gone to Columbia and come to New York, mm -hmm. want to pay that forward. So anyways, during um, the Great Recession, this organization that, which I had joined the board of uh, was falling apart. I became the board chair. Uh, one of the donors who um, was an uh, uh, alum of the Kennedy School was like, do you know what you're doing? I was like, I don't. I mean, how's it do? <laughs> She's like, well, I'd like for you to um, harden those soft skills, apply to my alma mater. Mm -hmm. I reluctantly did because I don't like school and Harvard Kennedy School. It's like, I don't follow politics or even read the newspaper. Um, my application essay was, how can I be a better chair for my nonprofit? Sent it in. Lo and behold, I get in. Right. I ended up going to this one year MPA program, um, met this woman, her name is Jean Brown Hell. She was a Loeb Fellow at the Graduate School of Design because she was um, beta testing this concept for this home innovation platform. We were connected because somebody said at the Kennedy School, she was auditing courses and the mutual class was like, there's a fellow architect that I want to introduce you to. And I was like, no, oh, don't. I didn't come here to meet architects. Um, mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah, come and meet this person. So we met, um, Jean shared the business model for a company called Sweeten, as in home sweet, home sweet in your home. Right. Um, I thought it was brilliant. When we finished our program, this is uh, 2012, she had asked me if I want to go raise some uh, venture capital, just do a seed round. I didn't know what that meant, so I was like, cool, why not? <laughs> um, spent six months raising the seed round, and when we got it, she's like, do you want to 
help execute on that plan as the COO, which these titles don't really mean much when it's just the two. We had a third co-founder, but sure. three of us, like, what does that mean? Um, and I agreed to do it because I was like, this, there's only 12 months of runway here. If anything, it'll be fun and I'll learn a lot. Uh, fast forward, I was the COO of Sweden until I stepped down um, the beginning of 2019. And at that point, Sweden wow. had raised uh, about 20 million in capital, rolled out to 10 major cities, and was a category lead for what it does in the home construction space. Uh, and while I was doing that, in parallel, co founded Adelis Novus with my business partners. Right. And um, that office I talked about, Christine Stanton, uh, MN occupied the top floor, which was the ninth floor mm -hmm. of that building, and Sweetum was on the fifth floor. So for years, I was just running Cut between the two, up and, up and down. And that, that's quite an extraordinary experience, and, yeah. and very unusual in the architecture space. To and, and actually to go through the whole process of raising capital and, yes. and actually be successful at it, and you know, dealing with big, big amounts of money, and the whole, the whole way that software startup companies work are very different from how an architecture practice is, is working and yes. you're probably not making profit for a very long time with the software and Correct. et cetera, et cetera. And you've got a different level of responsibilities, Correct. but a great way of kind of introducing to lots of different concepts about business. Yeah. And you know, um, that, that was my official, unofficial MBA. <laughs> uh, the thing with, um, doing sweet and that I realized very quickly is that, and this is not unique to tech, this is to just starting a business. Yeah. Is that, and I had learned this the hard way when I, um, you know, naively tried to do my own um, coming out of grad school at that point 10 years earlier. But when you raise venture capital, um, there's a, I describe it as you receive an unofficial playbook uh, from your investors or other advisors on best practices on how to build a business because let's not try to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. You have a limited uh, runway to be able to execute on your grand plan. And so here's the things you shouldn't do. And that does not, as you know, really exist in, in the architecture world. And so everything from, <coughs> and these aren't universal, but the ones that I was fortunate to be exposed to, everything from um, it's important to set a really strong culture and clear vision, um, ideally establish values that will be used to govern the team. Uh, I recognize that there's gonna be many departments that you have to build out. Uh, this is, this is, this is summarizing it a bit, but I remember, um, one piece of advice was, uh, there's three key components that, to any business, um, somebody to make it, somebody to sell it, somebody to maintain it. And it's like, that applies literally to every business. And so um, when I, when it was time to start MN with my business partners, um, and it was all a small family, everybody knew each other, everybody was friends. When it was time to start MN, it was like basically taking the best practices that I had learned through Sweden of building a company mm -hmm. and use that to be the playbook that is the foundation of our business model to this day, everything from identify what departments we need to make it, sell it, maintain it, to um, establishing our values as a company very early on. And it's something that, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of learnings, sure. a lot of growing pains. So sure. um, we continue to go through them now, um, but very much that startup mentality. Mm -hmm. We use the word startup here as well. Uh, we're nine years old, but from the very first day people get, um, onboarded here in that onboarding meeting, we talk about how as founders, we envision this as a startup and the model that we're trying to build. And yeah, it's it lots of overlaps. Um, and I think that has been key to how we've been able to grow so far. Why did you leave Sweden? Two things. Um, so it was, without going into too many details, um, summer 2016. I, with tech, and this isn't all tech companies, but at least in our company, 
there's a as a founder, you're fundraising like seventy five percent of the time. As yeah. soon as you raise, you close one round, you're already you take a breather for like two weeks. Yeah. And you're already thinking about the next round, and, and, you're, and, you're, and you're giving away more ownership of your baby all the way through. Totally, all the dilution and everything that comes with it. But in 2016, we had already done a few rounds, and I remember it was like we had closed one round, and then we already started looking to the next one. And it's like, you know what? The thrill of this is gone for me. Mm. I do not enjoy fundraising. I, I did not go. I do not like spending two weeks in Silicon Valley, Sand Hill Road. Like I was done and it took, honestly, it took another year of continuing to fundraise and build the company before 17, somewhere 17, I was like, no, I'm going to get out. Mm -hmm. And it took a full year to, um, find my successor as COO. Right. And then by the time she was brought on board, an amazing woman, um, and train her, uh, it was February, 2019 before it was time for before I was able to fully step out. Wow. It took that long. <clears throat> but really kind of unpick yourself from it. Yeah. Was it, was it, did you have to sell shares or anything or was it not that? No. So, so the other thing that's really nice about it that also made it very easy for me mentally was that um, the way the company was scaling and it was uh, starting its national rollout, I didn't want to, there's people who know how to do that as operators. And here I am, I've basically self-taught myself how to be a COO, which is common for many founders. But at this point, it's like, do I love this enough to want to self-teach myself national rollout or just hire someone who's successfully done it before? My shares are already vested. So it's in my best interest to have somebody come on board who yeah. knows how to do this. Um, and so, and not only that, where MN was at as an architecture firm, was super exciting and to be honest with you, I explored doing tech and I and I to this day still do my nonprofit still as the board chair because originally I was so frustrated with architecture that I was looking for something that saved me mm -hmm. from the profession. But that entire time that I was gone, and I was never really gone, but that I wasn't like in the day to day. I just loved it so much. And the way I describe it to people is like the young Preeti who was like over the moon to be at Jean Nouvel's office in Paris working for his idol and everything. That kid is always there. And I was just like, yeah, everybody said to me from the tech world, they're like, you're going to go back to that dinosaur industry. And I was like, it's really fucking awesome industry. It's It has its challenges, but hmm. I really like it and yeah i'm gonna get back into it i have these amazing business partners and um in starting this practice from day one we always said this isn't just going to be about doing beautiful forward thinking you know award winning design like we want to equally as important create a practice that this is in we came up with this uh we started coming up with a business plan uh the first half of 2014. The story is um, my uh, business partner, Stephen Harper, we would meet for the entire spring, summer, every Saturday afternoon on his couch up in Harlow. And we just like waxed poetic about like, what's this company going to be? And we didn't know when we were going to pull the trigger on actually doing it. What's this company going to be about? Everything from like, what types of projects, type you know, what scales, who are the clients to like, what are we going to call this thing? What's the mission, the vision to our creative director? Like he like, I remember it came with a spreadsheet. He was so proud of one day and it had the cost of running the office down to the cent um, for a dustpan. Cause it was also like, <laughs> if we're going to do this, uh, this has to be a real business. Yeah. Um, and we mapped out the entire business plan that over the course of many months and then through an opportunity uh our first big commission which was in the brooklyn navy yards um pulled the trigger mm -hmm. and and started our company and so yeah it was for me it was like i was very excited about a men's potential and so as i was doing that in parallel to sweeten and put them both in the in the same building i also just got to a place where i was like this company every time i 
get into my MN work, MN meetings, MN team, I'm like, I just love this. Yeah. I really love it. And yes, yeah, so 2019, I went from, I think realistically, if I was doing 50 hours sweet and 30 hours of men, Jeez. just put all 80 into it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and then another 10 hours a week on, on my nonprofit work. Yeah. That's, I was, that's, 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 a, that's pretty grueling. It was, you know, at the time when you're in it, you don't realize how bad it is. <laughs> um, I did, I did for those, um, for that decade, I did, uh, it, it was lockdown that helped me reset. But if you, if we went in that pre-lockdown, um, I, unofficial alcoholic, mm -hmm. I didn't drink a lot. Uh, I, I still have a drink now and then, but I drank a lot. I was 30 pounds heavier. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to be put on blood pressure meds because between anxiety and everything. It was just through the roof. Um, I had a, I had shaved head, shaved face for like that decade because I wanted to be as streamlined <laughs> as possible. And I wore the same <laughs> t-shirt, jeans, and sneakers every day because literally I was running between meetings and that was just my uniform. And I was just, it, to be honest with you, it was exciting, so I'm not complaining. Sure. But looking back, it, it took a huge toll on my health. Um, I really didn't even have like uh, real relationships. I had my my close friends, but um, my dating life was non-existent. It was terrible. Yeah. Um, but work-wise, a lot of things got accomplished. Well, and that's that's so you know quite so quite fascinating as well. Like you know how actually it's it's there's an unsustainability about it. Yes. And there's you pay a price. Absolutely, you're paying, you're paying a price to be able to engage with multiple businesses in the energy. I mean, just running an architecture practice is is one thing. Running, having a startup as well and a nonprofit yeah. is is yeah. is quite a lot. I mean, the way this I describe it is, um, so my business partners and I, none of us are from New York. Mm -hmm. um, the The line that I, I tell people casually is that I'm a child of Thai immigrants, grew up in rural Central Illinois. Um, my uh, creative director partner is um, a black Japanese architect from Oakland. Mm -hmm. Stephen, who I just mentioned, a white architect from the backwoods of North Carolina, a town even smaller than mine, which I didn't think was possible. Uh, and we came here not knowing anybody um, and not having any, any of like, the connections or anything. And so what do you do when you want to start your own practice and this is a practice we've had to completely bootstrap and now outside capital and yeah you can just say oh it's the hustle but as you know each of us when we start a practice we're going to be responsible for a vertical in the company jonathan was going to take on design steven was going to take on ops i was going to take on everything external facing so like the this dev client relationships and everything collectively the three of us made one architect <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was that for me being the one that's external facing, it's like how many of my, whether it's tech networks or relation, these different relationships I've made to help, you know, build a man. And it wasn't just getting clients. It's also like, how do you recruit talent when nobody knows who you are? Yeah. Right. And, and the other thing is in the, starting your own practice. I describe it as we've had to create our own lane because I, to non-architects, I describe architecture as this, the, the, the industry is uh, often a ladder that we have to climb. The first rung is something like you might be invited to sit on a jury or a panel. The next rung, you're doing lectures. The next rung, you're invited to do an installation at a gallery and then a competition Eventually, at the very top is uh, a museum or a library waiting for you. And the thing is, there's gatekeepers at every prompt. Mm -hmm. And so, what do you do when you're not even invited to climb that ladder? You have to make your own lane. So, for us, that hustle was, okay, we're not going to be in those circles. Well, how do we get work, get talent? Um, in the beginning, because our... Uh, we knew we weren't going to get any PR or press or anything. We spent, um, or first of all, we were just heads down. We said we would just focus on built work 
and allow the built work to speak for itself. And so for, for our practice, the classic, uh, yeah, the classic architect marketing move for sure. And I want to say that this was, this was very intentional in terms of a marketing strategy for like our first eight years until March of apologize for all the noise. There's always a lot of people coming through this office. Um, up until March of 23, the website that's up now is our first website that we've ever had before right. that it was just a contact page. Um, and so the reason why is we want to say, oh yeah, that was deliberate and we want to be elusive. But the truth is we were so heads down and just doing great built work, but also again, as a real business model, beautiful design. I hate Jonathan's going to say, don't say, just say beautiful. It's forward thinking. It's innovative. Mm -hmm. But doing great design, delivering as best we can on time, on budget. But then also the third piece is the client service layer to make sure the client's fully taken care of throughout. I think because we have been very successful at prioritizing those three, three things for our projects, we started getting tons of referrals. Like even to this day, overwhelming majority of our projects, 60 built commissions today, mm -hmm. um, almost all of them are repeat clients or referrals. So we didn't have to do a website. We yeah. just didn't have time, nor did we honestly have the financial resources to, to invest in. Well, it's, it's interesting as well that actually you built a business without, without website. No which, marketing or PR either. Which, which means something was happening in terms of how are you winning work? Yeah. What were you doing? Yeah. It, honestly, I think prior, so the, so again, no marketing or PR investment. Um, up until, up until we launched that site, the work being referral based, I'm jumping around a little bit to take a step back. So our first project was, um, in the Brooklyn Navy Yards, mm -hmm. decrepit warehouse, hundred thousand square feet that, uh, we were commissioned to turn it into a headquarters for, yeah. um, a, uh, a company that designs and, and fabricates uh, gear for it's like military and special forces applications and stuff. So, um, very lean budget. It's a, basically it's an adaptive reuse. This building, we had to tear down to its structure, rebuild the whole thing. Um, we ended up delivering that project on time, 3% under budget and won an AIA New York design to work for it. Um, and that was our very first project. Our next projects after that, um, so are the sexy. We did a, a Korean barbecue concept and you know, for us, it's first of all, you can only eat what you can kill. So it's like, all right, we're going to take this on, but we're going to make it really awesome. Um, and so this client, just to share that Korean barbecue concept came to us with uh, virtually no budget. Mm -hmm. I think his budget is the equivalent of a white box to do a restaurant here in the city. Mm -hmm. And with that budget, we designed um, a concept called Coat, which in the restaurant world is now like unicorn. Um, crazy, successful, impossible reservation. We ended up doing Coat Miami as a follow up. Uh, and then Coat Singapore more recently, like for the Coat team, it's, they're wildly successful. Yeah. Um, but, and then some other, that opened up the doors to more hospitality. And, and as architects, we never said we wanted to unnecessarily specialize in hospitality. So we've been very selective to take on um, only hospitality projects if they are concepts that we believe in. Right. That we'll go to ourselves. Because you can't design for a place if you're not actually going to hang out there. Sure. If it's with people who we think are going to be successful, just candidly, we tell potential clients this, there's just so much high turnover um, and the success rate is very <laughs> low, especially in New York, but I think yeah. just in general. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Re and restaurateurs and hospitality, that's such a, it's so risky. So absolutely. risky. This, this is where architects don't get paid when the, 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 the restaurant hasn't opened yet. Or you, or you get, you get bartered free meals, but then the restaurant closes before you can use your barter. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> so, so, and then the third thing that, um, is very important to us. And I mentioned that we started a company that's, um, 
very value space, something that we're strict about. I share this in every first potential client meeting, um, for better or worse, but it has been for better to date. And we have a very strict no asshole rule. And I told clients that in our first meeting, like, I just want you to know, my partners and I have built a value space company. One of our strict values is a no asshole rule. No asshole uh, project teams, uh, contractors, nor clients. Uh, it's something that's very important to us. And so, yeah, we, we, um, why did I get into it? Oh, as we got, as we did these early projects, because of the success of how we delivered them and the, mm -hmm. the outcomes that they yielded for, for our clients, we just got a lot of referrals and repeat clients. Mm -hmm. And we grew our practice. By the time we launched that website, March of 23, we were already 24 full-time, 60 built commissions. Um, never had a real website, never did marketing or PR. Uh, and also the AIA award, but then for the hospitality, nine Michelin stars, a world's 50 best, a Relais Chateau, a New York Times number one out of 100 best restaurants. Like Amazing. It's just, so that whole thing that we dreamed about, creating our own lane and let the built work speak for itself, it fortuitously, um, came true for us. Yeah. And so, um, the other thing that just to back up a little bit, just to share, I would say one of the things that we were very intentional about is, and I, I have, um, if, if you go to our website and it's also in the foyer of our, our lobby, when we founded our, our practice, we were inspired by this photo. Uh, it's of, uh, it's a photo taken by Martha Cooper, 1981. It's of Rocksteady, the, the breakdancing crew, battle dancing in front of Lincoln Center. And so it lives on our website. If you go to Firm, you can see it there. It also lives on my phone. Everybody who uh, meets me and talks about, and I introduce MM for the first time, always sees this photo from my phone. Um, and I always share that photo because for us, that photo represents quintessential New York City. It's about the city's public spaces, mm -hmm. welcoming people from different backgrounds together and make it their own. And we want that civic function to be a through line in all of our projects. Um, and so whether it's industrial in Brooklyn Navy Yards or hospitality or even commercial uh, retail, um, that is something that exists in every piece of work that we do. And so hospitality for us was like, internally we talk of them as, as uh, opportunities for us to test these concepts. And so on the hospitality front, people would say, oh yeah, an MM project. One, they're always ultra successful. Two, they're always critically acclaimed. Three, they're impossible reservations. Um, and the people always say like, you can tell, even though they're design-wise very different, there's a vibe and yeah. whenever I like really poke at that like really tell me the vibe that you talk about if i keep pushing people will be like you have diverse dining rooms like it's really a diverse audience whether it's the two michelin star places we've done or the places that are like michelin bib gourmands or whatever very diverse dining rooms and that is intentional and people will say well what is it that you do as a design and i always have to zoom out it's not design alone mm -hmm. that plays a role it's making sure that you are value aligned with the people that you worked with. Mm -hmm. And a line that I, I share a lot around here is um, we have a very strong belief that the built environment is imbued with the values of the people behind it. So the architect, uh, the client, contractor, everybody who comes together needs to share values in order to get the outcome that you want. And so for us to value being able to create welcoming inclusive spaces is something that we seek out in our clients as well. Right. And so the reason why our spaces have been able to yield these results is we've sought out what we call internally co-conspirators who believe in that and has allowed us to do this work. And we've been very steadfast. So, so th this is really impressive because a lot of architects, you know, they'll it's very easy to let go of your your values or to totally. to start working with people because you feel like you're on the back foot and then the yeah. client says you know drop drop your fees you drop your fees yeah. and now you're in this, this 
pricing war that yes. goes on yes. and now you've taken on a client that A is not a fit and B now you're right. paid not what you want to be getting paid Correct. and then it's difficult to get out of that cycle yes what was it that had you really hold on to the hey like we're not working with, with assholes we're not going to yeah we're not going to relinquish our, our values here and was it you know and particularly when architects are financially there isn't any there's nothing there this right. is when this is when we, we become quite vulnerable yes how did you just uh, maintain that and was it kind of partly because it was there was three of you as a dynamic where it was like you were holding uh, each other accountable in that sense or i mean i would be lying if i said i knew what we were doing <laughs> from the beginning uh lots of trial and error but what i would say um what we learned quickly in our experience is that first of all if you don't deliver great work, none of that matters, mm -hmm. right? But when you can deliver great work, then you can start making certain, um, I don't want to use the word demands because we're not necessarily demands. Like these, are, this is the criteria to work with us. Mm -hmm. In the beginnings, when you don't have that leverage, it was honestly like a lot of it is feeling out, of course, getting the clients that you can tell like, okay, these are some things... What I will say that we did, we always, that pitch that I just gave you, which I hate calling it a pitch because it really is more than a pitch to us. It really is what we live and breathe. Yeah. Um, has been the pitch since 2015 from Chump. Mm. Um, I even elaborate further. If you were the actual client, I will, I will, go, with, I will go further and say, um, and so when Jonathan Steele and I started the company, yes, we want to do forward thinking award-winning design, but equally important to us is that we want to uh, build a practice that we aspire to change the industry. And what that means is that in order to create these diverse spaces as a, from a team with diverse perspectives, our industry, as you know well, 2% black, at that time 17% women, I think it might be 20% now, but still uh, unfortunately too low. And that it's plagued by uh, high turnover, lack of upward mobility. And I will even go further and say, you know, in our industry, people will say uh, the reason why is that we have a recruitment problem. And you'll hear a lot of talk now around like, we got to go focus on the schools and high school and get kids excited. It's like, that's not the real problem. The real problem is that the industry is not financially stable. And does not give people an opportunity to come in and be successful. Yes. Right? Yes. So people can enter architecture, but they don't stay. And we lose a lot of talented, brilliant people to other industries. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, we wanted to create a better business model. Like the name Modellus Novus is mm -hmm. Latin for the new model. Because it's something that we're chasing after as, right. as, as our ethos. And so um, fast forward. The team we have now, just under 30 full time, as diverse as New York City, 50% women, all represent across every level of seniority. Um, our uh, pay starts at 10% above the AIA and Y average for their experience level. Um, we do not hire a fire for project. We've never done a layoff, not even during the pandemic. And something that we've been very proud of is that. Um, I believe the industry average in architecture is close to 15% turnover per year. We're at three. We have like almost most of the people who are here have been with us since they started with us. Some of them going back all nine years. Um, and that's something we're very proud of because yes. you want to give people a place where they can come in, and be successful as architects and show them that there's an opportunity to, again, have upward mobility. That's the only way that you're going to be able to create diverse teams. And hence, the only way you're going to be able to truly create diverse perspectives. Like I had, um, I was talking to somebody and I said, you cannot authentically create welcoming inclusive spaces if your team does not have those diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but our industry is just plagued by, I say, a homogeneity of like, you know, based both like socially but also economically, like the people who are in it. And therefore you have, you hear the same perspectives, the same references, the same inspirations. Um, and I talked, I did a keynote for the AIA Leadership Summit at the end of February. Um, and one of the lines that I had shared was something that 
I thought it was important for us to acknowledge, which is that in America, our public spaces, whether they are um, you know, institutions, establishments, parks, neighborhoods, are not welcoming nor inclusive. And a large part of it is because they're not being designed by teams with diverse perspectives. And I think that is a conversation that people don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of something that I I uh, talk a lot about here at MN with, with the larger team. We always ask ourselves in building the new model. Um, everybody has a startup mentality here. We're working on building this new model. Is um, We have this concept that we call uh, identifying the work at the center. Meaning if you take a whiteboard, draw all the problems, the main problem at the center of this whiteboard, the work at center, is the one thing that if you can fix this problem or make progress towards fixing it, you'll actually make the progress, like the hard Everything progress. else, yeah. Exactly. And so here we always ask ourselves, like, what's the work mm -hmm. that we need to focus on? Um, the fact, to me, the fact that I don't hear in our industry more people talk about the lack of diversity, but tying it also to we are not being responsible about how we hire and creating business practices that allow people to enter and stay and be successful, to me is work avoidance, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the thing where it's like, right now when I hear people say, oh, it's a recruitment issue and that's kicking the can down the road, that's work avoidance. Like we really need to ask ourselves like, how is it that we can fix the business? And a lot of architects will say like, I'm not a business person, I'm an architect. And it's like, I don't know what you mean, but then you shouldn't have gotten it. And why are you running a business? Why are you running a business? Yeah. Go work for somebody else. And so I can go down the rabbit hole. But the one thing I'll say is the challenge with that is that if you don't understand how to run a business, if you don't understand your unit economics, mm -hmm. then you don't understand what you're supposed to be charging. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand what you're supposed to be charging, then you don't know when you are undercutting somebody else. Or if you do know what you're charging, especially these more established firms, but your unit economics are, then when you're undercutting yourself to win a project, you're just doing it on the backs of your employees, you know? And it's, and I think this is, these are the real conversations that well, I, need to be had. This is really interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm very much in agreement with you about, um, you know, when we have conversations about diversity and I've said this many times on the, on the podcast before, but the real issue is not necessarily diversity. It's the, it's the finances, it's the financial equation Absolutely. of the profession. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in the UK, for example, a lot of, and black or minority people, they're the first generation of their family to go to university. Yeah. There's also an expectation yeah. um, that they might have to be bringing money back home to the, to the, to the parents. Absolutely. And, you know, and if you're going to be spending seven years, which is already too long, too protracted, unnecessary, yeah. huge amount of investment in time and money, and then to come out and get paid the same that you would if you were working in McDonald's, just the, the equation doesn't work. Uh, the financial equation doesn't work. It's got nothing else to do. It's just not appealing. So that's why people leave. And it's the same thing with women. If they're, if they're, if they're working or they're, then they have to take time out to have family, yeah. et cetera, the, the economics of it don't make sense. Yes. So people leave. Yes. And, you know, again, it's, you have to give people from different backgrounds an opportunity to enter and thrive and be successful architects themselves. I think, um, you know, you hear the, the term generational wealth a lot. Mm -hmm. But that's something important to recognize because the other thing is a lot of people who don't have those financially stable backgrounds or some type of safety net cannot go into a profession where you're getting hired and fired per project or you know that has, the, the ter has such high turnover. Mm -hmm. Again, this whole, I witness it myself, so many talented, brilliant people enter and then leave our profession, right? And so I always tell people, again, whether people in tech or my, or fellow architects, because you'll get together those, you know, majority of architects you get together with them and it's, you're hearing them either talk about some kick-ass project that, you know, they want to brag about, love that, um, or they'll be lamenting the industry. And to me, I always tell them like, I love my job. Mm -hmm. I love what I do. It has a lot of challenges. 
don't get me wrong. We are entering, uh, we are in our ninth year as a practice. We are going through growing pains. Uh, we've had growing pains every year. We're going through a new set right now. Um, the team will tell you if they, they, I'm sure they'll come in and be like, well, here's the things that we need to work on and do better. Um, but I love it because we are trying to solve a problem that hasn't been done in our industry before. And not saying that our solution is going to be the solution that's going to help others. I will say, um, and why I was happy that, uh, we had the opportunity to talk. I do want to take the learnings, my partners and I want to take the learnings that we've had over the years and start open source sharing it with others. So, uh, I shouldn't say this on this podcast, but our goal is to on a quarterly or at least half year basis, but hopefully quarterly start putting out, um, we have a series of mediums that each partner is working on based off of their, mm -hmm. their vertical that, that they oversee here. Just learnings that we've had over the years to share with others to see, you know, anybody else that can benefit from it. Because if we can help lift the industry, it benefits all of us, not just the whole like create better spaces, but like, I have to tell you, I am very, as many of your uh, followers are, it is frustrating to go compete with other firms for commissions and find out later that you are undercut when you already know like the math of your fees. Like if we want something really bad, it's like, okay, we're going to go in razor thin to get this. And based off of that client's parameters, like this is the cheapest you can reasonably go. And to find out we are undercut by half, impossible, impossible. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know if that firm knows that their unit economics aren't going to be able to produce that mm -hmm. project without doing it on the backs of their employees. Like, again, want to help, we want to do what we can to help. It's, the it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to hear that, that kind of opening up and transparency. Yeah. And I think that certainly kind of modern contemporary leadership of an architectural firm needs, demands transparency from its leaders. It yes. needs transparency in terms of the economics. Yes. People should understand and start being indoctrinated with the way of money and how it's working yeah. in the business. And the leaders need to demonstrate that they're actually taking it seriously and they care about it. Absolutely. Otherwise, why would you want to be working for someone that's that, that's that's not doing that? And the, the, the history cool. of the profession has been very, you know, keep all this information closed yes. and quiet and we don't yes. talk about it. And yes. And that and and then also in just terms of knowledge, you know, the open source of of you know technical knowledge expertise of the industry knowledge that you've been working yep. on this transparency is only going to make the industry better the industry becomes better everyone benefits absolutely and there's you know we can start making it a you know a, a very attractive profession for anybody who wants to get access to it again i really love architecture and if more people who also love this profession can actively practice and be successful at it, we're all going to benefit. So that's something that, again, I, I, I need to look up this and get the exact facts of this right. But I think it was like either Mercedes Benz or Volvo or somebody came up with the airbag, but did not, did not go through the traditional patent routes or whatever, because they wanted to share that technology with everybody. And we have that same, I mean, that's, that's an extreme example. Um, but we want to, we have that same ethos where it's like, as we're learning, let's share, share it with others mm -hmm. because we're all going to benefit. Um, and to be honest too, like I see all of my other like peers and friends practices and everything. And there's so many talented people and we all have our shared challenges. And it's like, if we could share the learning, so like, all these people that that are you know you bring great people great talent to do shape spaces like you just want to see them all be successful yeah yeah absolutely brilliant i think that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation awesome. pretty absolute pleasure to be speaking with you thank you ryan it's been it's been a pleasure as well thank you again for having me and that's a wrap. And one more thing, if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback. 
and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.